Hello. Um, uh, I would like to welcome you here, and thanks for, for coming to this press conference. I would like to welcome with us today um, Dr. Visa, who is the Executive Director of the Euro European Asylum Support Office, and also Commissioner Malmström, which needs little introduction. Um, uh, Dr. Visa will now give an introductory statement, which will be then followed by a statement uh, by Commissioner Malmström, and then we'll have time for uh, a few questions. Okay, thank you. I'll uh, leave the word to Dr. Visa now. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Very welcome here at the launch, the first public launch of the annual report on the situation of asylum in the European Union. Some of you have already asked me why this report, because the Commission published a report on asylum and migration not too long ago. That's exactly a good question. The first is the Commission to publish the overall and policy-oriented uh, report and as an operational agency, independent, as it said, but working within the political remit of the Commissioner, uh, we publish from the operational and practical side uh, the year report. That is exactly our ambition with this report. It has already become, it's the third report now, the first publicly, public event, but the third year that we published this report, to become a sort of yearbook, a reference document with facts and figures giving the picture as uh, impartial, as expert-like as possible. I'm particularly happy that the Commissioner is here today to add from the more policy side, some remarks uh, when I have made a short introduction on what you can see and read in the report, but also because 2013 is already nearly half a year behind us, also what has happened since uh, the beginning of this year, where the changes and the trends are. 2013 has seen 400 and 35,000 more or less uh, people asking for and seeking international protection. That is a 30% rise compared to the year before 2012, and 2012 was already more than the year before. So we see a number of years of increasing trend in numbers. If we look at the first months of this year, you see a further increase. Behind me on the screen, you can see the graphics uh, on this. That is not a surprise for anyone who regularly looks at Euro News or BBC World. North Africa, Syria, recently maybe Iraq, uh, and only to mention a few. In 2013, the main countries were Syrians. That's not a surprise. Uh, Russians, and if we take them together, the six countries of the Western Balkan. The Western Balkan, as you could have seen in our report last year, is already for a number of years, as a total, a very important part of the asylum numbers in Europe. Russia last year was a very sudden and big increase, but if we look at the end of the year, it already went down. That is the second uh, point to take into account. The overall trend is upwards for the last years. I do not predict the day after tomorrow. It's only till today that I can give you the figures. Uh, but within that increasing trend, you see countries that go up and countries that go down. Russia has gone down since the end of last year. Since the beginning of this year, we suddenly saw Eritrea coming up uh, very importantly. In itself, there's not a real 
good explanation that I have heard. The situation in Eritrea was bad and is still bad, but has not really seen dramatic changes. But the influx in Europe certainly has. Another point that is interesting in uh, the work that IASO is doing is that since we have our data collection, we are able not only to give a regular overview, which so far didn't exist, of the influx of asylum applications in Europe, but also to give it on a very uh, update way. Uh, Eurostat, for your explanation, Eurostat is providing information that is validated, but because it has to be validated, it is at least six and sometimes even more uh, months old, and that for migration operational purposes is too old. You want to know what happens just now and not what happened half a year or a year ago. Uh, and to show how effectively that is, I can give you two examples. Last year we saw much earlier than normally we would have seen the changes in Bulgaria with a rapidly, rapidly uh, increasing number of Syrians applying for asylum in Bulgaria. And the fact that we were able to detect this so early uh, made it easier for us, for the Commission um, as well, to start on an operational support for Bulgaria, which is still ongoing. In the same way, we very recently saw a sudden rise in Ukrainian applications. That is not Ukrainians in the vast majority that come from Ukraine. Well, they have Ukrainian nationality, but they do not travel from Ukraine. Most of them uh, are applying for asylum, already living, working somewhere in the European Union. That <coughs> is something that we have seen in the Syrian situation a year and a half as well, uh, ago as well. The first applications start by people who are outside of the country where uh, the situation is getting worse and then not wanting to return, start asking for asylum. This is as far as the comparison go. As I said, I don't give any predictions about tomorrow. Last point. Uh, on this basis, we are working at this moment in four member states, Bulgaria, Italy, Greece, and Cyprus, all of them for good but different reasons. Uh, and I finalize with two uh, last remarks. Implementation of the asylum key that was decided on last year will be the number one priority on all the member states' agendas and so on the agenda of uh, IASO. And last but absolutely not least, it's my great privilege to hand over the first copy of the annual report to the Commission. Thank you very much for this formal handover of the report. Uh, and thank you for inviting me here today to say a few words um, on this as well. As you all know, you are journalists, you are following this, we really live in transformational times when it comes to asylum. We have in our immediate neighborhood very worrying situations in Syria, of course, Iraq, Ukraine, and in several parts of North Africa. It is transformational also because we adopted, as Dr. Visser said last year, the new generation of EU asylum laws. It is transformational because we now have fully functioning and very active uh, asylum support office assisting member states on the ground when they are facing difficult situations by providing practical support. And all this is explained in the annual report, uh, which contains a lot of very, very useful information. 
EASO is documenting what is going on, both within the EU, across the world, so that we can better monitor the situation and the flow of persons who intend to apply for protection. Because, of course, something happening outside will quite immediately have repercussions at our borders as well. So we need to be as prepared as we possibly can. The report is also important because it gives you a more detailed overview of the trends throughout the year. Where do people come from? How do they travel? Where do they go in Europe? Where are the weaknesses in our national systems? We have indeed adopted new laws. Uh, and uh, the newly agreed laws will lead to fairer, quicker and better quality of the asylum decisions. There will be greater protection of unaccompanied minors, victims of torture, and women who have suffered sexual violence. Our laws will ensure a humane reception conditions, such as housing, for asylum seekers across the EU, and that the fundamental rights are fully respected. We have considerably reduced the possibility to detain asylum seekers, and all member states must to make sure that the decisions, the interviews, the handling are done by qualified persons. So agreeing these laws were quite difficult, uh, but that's only half the effort. Now they need to be put in place so that we have a functioning system all across the EU. The ASO is therefore key in assisting member states together with the Commission in implementing the laws and we will monitor as we are how they are functioning and avoiding weak links. All member states also have to have them in place. In some member states, there are minor adjustments to be done, some have uh, more to do, and some countries will actually have to build up basically a system from the beginning. And with all this in place in a couple of years, hopefully all 28 countries can take a responsibility. As we know today, there's not even half of the member states who really uh, do their part in receiving the asylum seekers. So we hope that this will lead to similar procedures, similar outcomes, similar conditions, no matter where an asylum seeker hand over their, their application. So all member states must show that responsibility to ensure that they have done everything they reasonably can to put this uh, in, in place correctly and have well-functioning systems. One part of the new legislation also contains a reviewed Dublin regulation, and in that we have a new article, Article 33, that creates a process of early warning, uh, preparedness and management of the crisis. This mechanism is a true solidarity mechanism. When we discover, together with EASO, monitoring the situation, that here a country has specific weaknesses, maybe because there is a lot of pressure or maybe there are some structural efforts, we can mobilize all the tools and resources that we have uh, at our disposal, together with that country, drafting up an action plan. And this is one of the ways we can see so that our, our asylum package is also accompanied by solidarity and sharing the responsibility. The Asylum Support Office was created to assist member states in implementing the EU. We have designed, and, and Mr. Dr. Visser can answer questions about that in more in detail, should you wish your training modules, for instance, in the European asylum curriculum, so that asylum case workers work according to the same standards. And sharing the country of origin information provided by the ASO is also very important so that all the field workers can get up-to-date information about the source country so that the inf decisions can be more informed. One issue where we will also count even more on the assistance of the ASO is the issue of resettlement. There is a strong emphasis on assisting Syrians at the moment, but there are also other countries that would need support. And people do embark on rickety vessels on very dangerous travels because there are very few, if any, legal ways to get to Europe. And one way to achieve, to receive, to achieve, to come to Europe in a safe way would be through increased resettlement. We must increase this, and this is the clear aim. We are working with the ASO, with member states, UNHCR and others, to make sure that all countries can engage in resettlement and to take their part of the responsibility and building up the capacity uh, to do so. So I will not be, be longer here. Uh, there is, of course, a lot to be done on asylum. This is a fairly new area of cooperation in the European Union. So if you look back, you will see that we have achieved a lot. Of course, there are huge challenges in the future. This is an issue that will remain very high on the agenda for the coming years, if not uh, decades. 
uh, we have achieved a lot, as I said, and I am really confident that we will keep on working with the European approach, with the new laws, and with EASO being there to support countries uh, that, that do need this assistance, for instance, in, in Bulgaria, Greece, uh, Italy. Cyprus, I think you are also Sorry. present uh, for the moment. So it's a small agency that has not existed for long, but uh, it does a formidable job, and I'm really happy and proud to be able to share the stage here with you today. Rob, thank you very much. And thank you, Ana Pisonero from the Spanish news agency Europa Press. I would like to ask you on the data from 2013. I understand that Spain is the third country where asylum uh, secret, well, where petitions most went up after, I think it was Hungary, where it went up by like 777% and Bulgaria as well. Um, so in Spain, it increased 75% compared to the 30% in the whole EU. Why, well, um, how, what can we attribute this strong increase in Spain? Because we understand that Spain is not traditionally one of the countries that actually gets most demands. It's more mainly the northern uh, countries. So I don't know if you have any explanation why this has happened. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's a mistake to think that uh, these days the northern countries only uh, get the asylum requests. If you look into our report, you can see that in the last years this is quickly changing. Uh, for example, Italy, I will come back on Spain, Italy uh, is already for two years in the top five, top six. Uh, of the member states with asylum applications. Uh, what happens after the, that moment is a second uh, question, but it is certainly important that there is a shift. The same in the East, where uh, Poland, for example, has become a real asylum uh, receiving country. Uh, that are changes, and they certainly uh, need our, our uh, attention further to see how that will develop. Uh, but the pattern, at least, is changing. Uh, second, uh, specifically about Spain, Spain had a number of years ago uh, a large influx, especially by the Canary Islands and later on by Ciuta Melilla, um, and is recently seeing it again. Uh, the best, the closest explanation you can get is that it is linked both to the situation and the changes in the North uh, African region, combined with the more uh, sub-Saharan changes where it is far, we don't see that too much on the news, it is far from quiet, uh, to put it mildly. Thank you. Mario Capato, Nova News Agency Italy. I have a question for the Commissioner on Western Balkans, because despite all the measures to, to, for, the num for, for the number of the asylum seekers from Western Balkans, the number is still increasing. Do you fear that some member states uh, can ask to trigger the clause of safeguard, of safeguard and uh, to stop visa-free travel from, from the Western Balkans? And what the Commission, the European Asylum Support Office or the member of the country of the, of the region can do to, to stop this, uh, uh, this number still increasing. Thank you. Yes, this is indeed a very serious issue because we have uh, accomplished visa freedom with the countries of the Western Balkans, all of them except uh, Kosovo, and this is something really good. And a huge majority of the citizens who are using this possibility are doing that fully according to the rules, and it has achieved increased people-to-people -people contact, business opportunities, and so on. But we do have a small group of people. Uh, unfortunately, even if there are some decreases, overall it is not going down of people who ask for asylum. Uh, and this is, of course, uh, uh, we see that they are unfounded, because there are maybe a handful of all those who ask who get asylum, but, but a huge majority, almost 99% or 98, uh, are being rejected. And this is, of course, putting a lot of pressure on the asylum system in those countries who are already under pressure from Syrian refugees or, or, or Eritreans or, or others. We are in contact with, uh, with the countries of the Balkans to, to all the time see how we can help to support them to do this. 
uh, how they can work better to inform about the possibilities of the visa uh, freedom, but also about the abuses. We see that there are lots of good campaigns and, and cooperation going on, uh, but unfortunately not enough results still. We have the suspension mechanism. Uh, I don't exclude that this could be, um, this would be discussed again with member states. Some might call for, for the activation of this. This, of course, would be very unfortunate because it would strike to, to those majority who, who do not abuse it. But we will be in constant um, contact again and, and see what more we can done, do, be, be doing, both on short term. On long term, it's about, of course, uh, improving the conditions of, of, of the Romas in these countries, where we think there can be more done while recognizing that this is not something that will change in a week and it will take years. Uh, but we will continue to work with these countries as well. It's, it's an unfortunate trend. Uh, Alex Panther from Austrian Press Agency. I have a question on uh, resettlement issue and uh, the Syrians. Uh, now, can, uh, can countries like Austria, Austria has uh, uh, um, created a resettlement mechanism last year, but said it would uh, like to give preference to female refugees, children and Christians. How do you see this kind of discriminatory practice? Um, well, we are extremely happy that countries who have not formally um, had resettlement programs are embarking, for instance, like uh, Austria. Exactly how people are chosen uh, in the individual quotas is an issue between the member countries and UNHCR, where they do this together, so the Commission has no, no opinion on this. I'm Jan Smuller from the Swedish Radio. Uh, Mr. Visser, you said uh, you can't make predictions for tomorrow or next week. Is there anyone who can? And if not, how do you possibly manage uh, to, to uh, well, handle the asylum seekers? I like that question. Thank you very much. Um, yes, of course, politicians are paid to make predictions. Um, and we are paid to uh, make it possible. Uh, you can't predict the future, uh, but you certainly can prepare for the future. And that is exactly what we do, based on historical data, as recent as we can. That is why it's so important not to use only the old data that uh, up till now we were used to do, uh, but really have data from uh, just a few days sometimes ago. Uh, that means that you see trends. And as much as I cannot predict exactly what is the future for tomorrow, as much can I can suggest or suppose that tomorrow might be an ongoing trend of a certain period, uh, because it will not change 180% in one, one day. In general, there are exceptions in history. Um, so it's absolutely closer to what we had as a system, a trend analysis which leads to a risk analysis. Uh, but pretending that in five months from now we will have a number which more or less we can now predict is pretending something that is, I would say, nearly by definition not possible. Even though there might be lucky ones that in retrospect say, we guessed right. Uh, Terry Schultz for Security Europe. Um, I wanted to ask um, the commissioner about uh, about a problem that you have you have talked about in the press recently, and that is the failure to fingerprint by some governments, in particular Italy, um, which is a apparently not living up to its obligation to finger fingerprint everyone who arrives. What kind of security risks does does this cause? You were quoted in a Swedish paper as saying it's a very serious problem. So can you talk about what kind of problems can come out of this in the security aspect? And also, are, are other countries doing a better job of fingerprinting than Italy? And why is this so important for security reasons other than simply knowing where these, knowing whether these people are reapplying in too short of a period? Thanks. Thank you. I don't think I have referred to any security problem related to this. We have got indications from some countries that uh, Italy and other countries uh, do not completely uh, fulfill the obligations in fingerprinting asylum seekers. So we are looking at whether there could be 
um, more information given to those who immediately, I mean, Italy is under enormous pressure right now. Only this weekend, I think 3,000 people arrived, so a lot of people arrived to Italy. And of course, uh, we need to, to make sure that those who want to ask for asylum are giving their, their, their fingerprints. So we need to make sure that everybody working uh, with this are informed about this, that to inform the people who come, if you want to ask for asylum, you need to, to, to give your, your fingerprints. If not, there is no way we can force people give give the fingerprints, of course. So we, we are talking to countries uh, to see if there is uh, you know, a systematic problem here or if there is just an omission because of, of a very strong uh, pressure. Uh, and there, there are th this indication come from a, some countries. Uh, you mentioned Sweden, but also others, and uh, also in, in other countries under pressure. So we're we looking at this. Well, the, the Eurodac, where they are giving uh, asylum, uh, th this is uh, mainly for, for uh, th this is a central base for asylum seekers. And uh, only on, on a non-hit uh, basis can you look at this. The Eurodac uh, fingerprint system is not given to, uh, to, to the law enforcement authorities. You can look for this if you have an indication that Cecilia Malmström is a researched, is a uh, looked after wanted terrorist. You can look in the Euro base, Eurodac base to see if Cecilia Malmström is there on a hit, non-hit basis. But you cannot freely walk around in the Eurodac basis. It's not given to, to law enforcement. I have um, uh, tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, Justice and Home uh, Ministers of Justice and Home Affairs are meeting in Milan, and on the top of their agenda, there will be the migrations policy of the European Union. So now I have a general question to you. Um, in October, there many many thousands of uh, like people died in front of Lampedusa and of the coast of Italy, and there you promised that something will change. If you could summarize for us what has changed since then. This is one issue that will be discussed tomorrow. I think 360 people died that day in Lampedusa, but of course, uh, in, in look, looking back in the years, probably many thousand people have drowned in the Mediterranean, and this is a, a terrible uh, problem. We set up the Task Force Mediterranean at that occasion, looking at different issues. First, of course, immediate uh, assistance to uh, to Italy and others who are under this. We managed to find a, a, an emergency pot of money uh, to, to mobilize for, for, for that, uh, where most of it has gone to Italy, but also some to, to Bulgaria and others. We are also, uh, as I said, calling for, for uh, resettlement so other countries can alleviate a little bit the pressure so that people can have a safe to journey to, to Europe. We are looking on how to cooperate with uh, transit countries, countries of origin, when that is possible. We have concluded uh, mobility partnerships with Tunisia and Morocco. We are about to conclude one with uh, Jordan, so we can have a, a broad cooperation on mobility, both assisting those countries to receive asylum seekers and migrants having a fair and good systems uh, in order, but also uh, to fight uh, traffickers. Trafficking is, is a huge problem, and many of those people who who are most of those people who embark on these uh, boats pay huge sums uh, once they arrive to the coasts of, of Libya, probably before they have been, been, been raped and robbed and, and, and had to pay ransoms many times during their journey. So we need to cooperate to fight these trafficking networks. And we have engaged since then with the African Union, and there will be a, a conference on this issue by the Italian presidency later this fall. I don't know the date yet. Uh, we are also looking at how we can, for the those... Um, people who run away more for economic reasons to, to together with uh, IOM and UNHCR inform about the risks uh, in certain countries uh, that, that they are, are taking. And we're taking a lot of a broad spectrum, but of course it takes uh, time to put this in place. So m much have been done. We have also reinforced our presence, of course, Italy, as someone mentioned here, the Mare Nostrum operation, uh, but also uh, increased the Frontex um, presence in in uh, in the Mediterranean, and we are looking out to see how member states can can increase their contribution there because the Frontex budget is very small, and it will not be be enough to just take over an operation in, in Italy like that. So lots of things are happening. We have a long list of, of proposals. Some are going well. Some member states need to do more, and that's why we are having that on the agenda tomorrow, uh, the Task Force Mediterranean, to see what, what more uh, can be done. This is certainly an issue where lots of work needs to be done for many, many years to come. It's Lucia Villan with El País. I would like to ask the Commissioner uh, about the question of resettlement. Uh, you said more countries should engage on that. And what figure do you think it's affordable for the EU? 
what figure of, of resettlements and which countries should engage more precisely. Thank you. I cannot say a figure. Uh, we know that the neighboring countries outside Syria have received three million refugees at least. Uh, we have millions of internally displaced Syrians. Less than 100,000 Syrians have come to Europe in 28 countries. That's not a lot of people. Uh, today, around half of the countries have said that they would engage in resettlement from uh, Syria. I think all 28 should. Of course, a country who have not that tradition can start with a few families. We have set aside a lump sum in the European Union budget of 6,000 euros with each, for each resettled refugees. We can provide uh, support and, and uh, training in order to, 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 to start building up the capacity. Yeah, so can also help uh, with this. Uh, so I think 28 countries should engage in, in resettlement. I cannot put a, a figure because the needs are, are immense, of course. But if all countries resettled as many as the two who take most, Sweden and Germany, we could at least help 150,000 resettled refugees, proportionally, I mean, by, by country. Uh, so, so this could be, be a figure to start with. That report doesn't exist yet. I said it was on uh, work in progress. It will be presented uh, by, by the autumn. Um, so that action plan doesn't exist yet. Uh, well, that is, of course, a very valid question because on the one hand, we want to open channels for people to come and ask for asylum. That is a fundamental right uh, protected by the Geneva Con Convention and European laws. Anyone has the right to come to any EU country and ask for asylum and have a fair trial. And the problem today is that there are, even if we get the new asylum system working perfectly, that's fine, but it's only valid when you reach the border. And in order to reach the border, you have a very l small channel of resettlement, um, but nothing else. So people are, vict are, 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 are the only, only thing they can do is to, to embark on, on different smuggling ways, uh, if, if that is possible. Now, of course, human trafficking, and you would have read uh, lots about this, is, is, is a terrible thing because people are really abused. They are being robbed, they are being, being raped, they are being tortured, they have terrible stories to say. If, they at, if at all they survive and come. So of course we need to cooperate with transit countries to, to fight this. But at the same time, we also need to find legal ways uh, to get uh, to, to Europe. And resettlement is, is the so easiest and quickest way to do that. The Commission have also said that we will want to look at possibilities of issuing humanitarian visas or joint processing of so, or so on. This is not very popular by member states, but we, we will see what, what we can do at least to have the discussion uh, on, the, on the table. Do you see progress in this or nothing at all? For the moment, no. Uh, but uh, we will keep on looking at the different possibilities, see what more uh, can, can be done that, because it, of course it, we need to have ways to, for people to get, and if there are no legal ways, people will, will choose, choose other illegal ways, either over the Mediterranean or via false passports or, or being smuggled in uh, lorries, containers, as, as they do also uh, to, to Northern Europe. Less spectacular, but this happens every day uh, as well. So there needs to be, be a combination there. But to fight trafficking and smuggling of, 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 uh, of, uh, of citizens, it's, a, it's a hugely lucrative business and it really exploits the, 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 the poorest of people. Um, so we need to fight that but we need to compensate of course by finding legal ways. Just in, in addition to this, um, within the context of the Task Force Mediterranean, uh, IASO is working on a pilot basis together with Frontex, Eurojust and uh, Europol on getting a better view on exactly how the networking works. We know that it is there. We know that those are the people that gain, literally, uh, financially, uh, most of the whole process. 
uh, and that the abuses and misuses are enormous. Uh, what we do not yet know is, and that's why we combine forces with Frontex and, uh, and Europol as well, is how, how the system works, the sort of networks, the sort of facilitators. And what we are trying now in a joint effort is in a pilot base to have to gather data, not individual cases, of course, because these are humanitarian cases, but data on an abstract level to have a better view on this whole process. That is part of the whole uh, solution because, of course, the legal uh, entry questions are there as well, as the Commissioner explained, but it is certainly not something that we can uh, do away with. Hi, Medina Stavis from the Wall Street Journal. Two questions for Dr. Visse. Um, the first is, in your press release regarding the latest um, asylum trends for this year, there is mention um, on Ukraine, and you said that most of these people are people who are already living or working in the European Union. Could you possibly provide some additional information around the Ukrainian situation? So, for example, example which countries uh, they're mostly in, um, and that sort of thing. Um, also, it says here, in the last 20 years, the average number of applications was roughly 100 applicants per month. Was that the case, um, include up to and including the early months of, of this year? and then dramatically changed after March. So any additional information in Ukraine? Second question, um, with utilizing your early warning system, despite the absence of a crystal ball, could you talk to us a little bit about the situation in Iraq? Um, if you're seeing any first uh, signs of um, uptick in Iraqi arrivals, um, and what consultation you might be having with member states and which member states to prepare for um, receiving more Iraqi citizens. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ukraine first. Uh, up till March, we didn't saw any real changes in uh, numbers. And then suddenly it started rising, six, seven, eight hundred up till now, between March and May, about uh, 2000. Not enormous numbers, but important indicators. Uh, Second, what is interesting is that it is not confined to one or two countries, uh, but that it is spread over uh, most of the European countries. Thirdly, there is a long uh, tradition of uh, labor migration between Ukrainians and uh, especially the eastern uh, EU member states, Poland and uh, the Czech Republic and uh, Slovakia in, in, in particular, but not only, uh, Romania as well. Uh, but there are also communities, large communities of Ukrainians uh, elsewhere in Europe. What you might suspect by the numbers, comparing the numbers and the fact that not too many ask for asylum at the border, which means that probably they are already here, is that they use their traditional way of migration, labor migration, or uh, if it's settlement uh, families, and uh, ask when they are within the European Union uh, for asylum as a guarantee or a second guarantee if they have still a, a visa that is, uh, that is valid. Uh, that's at mu as much as we can see at this moment. What I said earlier on, uh, from the Syrian situation, we know, and also from uh, longer ago experience, we know that this might indicate a first step in a longer going uh, trend. But that's as far as my crystal ball is, is going. Uh, on Iraqi, so far, but that is really day to day uh, business, so far we don't see real increasing numbers. Uh, having said that, Europe has an enormous, uh, long-standing number of uh, Iraqi communities dating back to the, the wars in the 90s already. Um, so when something happens, then you might expect that the different communities in most member states uh, will be the, 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 the direction that, that people will go.
treated by local authorities? Or is well, it too early to say? What we see at this moment, but that is very, uh, very recent information, is that a number of member states are now uh, deciding to keep up decisions. <coughs> that is a, no, a normal first step. Uh, when a situation in a country of origin changes dramatically, then you don't have enough information to decide in individual cases. So that means that you say, well, we will not make a quick, quick decision, which traditionally for Ukrainians would be no. Uh, but given this situation, let's see, wait and see a moment and uh, uh, decide uh, later on, which is the situation at this moment in, 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 in some member states. Kalle Joosten, The Netherlands, Elsevier, Weekly. I have a question for the both of you. How come countries still don't have implemented the asylum rules? Because it's been talked about so long in Brussels. Uh, and as I understand, some countries don't have this any system at all. Second question, um, could you confirm that the Dublin rule doesn't exist anymore, isn't functioning anymore? Thank you. On the first question, the, uh, the new uh, set of laws are only uh, to be implemented by 2015. So countries have uh, uh, almost a year still to do that. Um, some, as I said, uh, are basically there. Some need to build it up from the beginning, so probably the 2015 will still not be, be enough, but gradually. And some countries face... Uh, I mean, it would be very nice if we first decided on the rules, we implemented this, and then we opened up the door for reality. But that's not how it works. A country like Bulgaria, who have very little experience in receiving uh, migrants, got a lot, I think 11 or 12,000 in only a couple of, of months coming from Syria mainly. So, of course, they, they were not prepared for this. And there, EASO and many member states and the Commission and, and uh, NGOs have tried to, do, uh, to help them. They've done a, a very, very impressive work uh, lately in order to try to accommodate these people and give them a dignified uh, reception. So, so reality is uh, as it is. But formally, uh, the, the, the directives uh, will be in place in next year. When it comes to Dublin, well, no, I don't think it's correct. That is not working. Uh, it works mainly. It's still the basis. Uh, Dublin contains many provisions. For instance, the Article 33 that I said, also protection for, for uh, uh, minors, uh, rules on detention, and, and so on. But the, the main issue there that is often criticized is the first uh, country of asylum. This is still uh, basically uh, respected. We have just uh, from the Commission side uh, um, amended the rules that we will have now presented to the European Parliament and the, and the Council when it comes to unaccompanied minors following uh, a verdict in the court uh, where the good of the child should always be there. So that means that if a child is discovered in another country than the first country of entrance, uh, that c child can, unless it would be better for him or her to to be, be sent back, he or she could file a new application in the country where he or she is, is, is found. Uh, so, but Dublin still works. This element of first country of asylum is something that member states cherish very much. Uh, I think 25 countries said this will not change. Uh, we will, of course, continue to, to monitoring this. There was a question by your neighbour on, on uh, fingerprinting. There are elements that we are looking at where there seems to be, be minor uh, problems, uh, but I wouldn't say that Dublin has collapsed, no. <coughs> Let me add two short remarks. One on Dublin. Uh, if you look into our report, then you'll see for the first time that we uh, devote time and analysis on Dublin uh, and showing that indeed it does work. Uh, I will refer that uh, to the report for time's sake. Um, and second, our own experience on the ground working on the operations is that member states are taking very serious uh, to implement the asylum package as it was decided last year. Uh, so I'm certainly not as pessimistic as uh, I might seem to hear in your question, uh, but it, it takes time because there is a shifting reality also in migration. Uh, the, the, the influx of today 
is maybe different from some time ago, and then your asylum system might, on paper, maybe being perfect. Uh, the practical operations uh, is another thing, and that is exactly where EASO is trying to support the member states as well. Uh, maybe uh, Nathalie van der Stad from Europolitics and Lacroix. I just wanted to come back on Libya. Um, I mean, is there any progress in the in the fact that the EU sent uh, some officers officers there? I mean, is there any progress in the in the discussions with Libya? I mean, with the situation there, and they had a vote, but uh, uh, quite a vote. Um, first question and. I just wanted to know if you have numbers of how many asylum seekers are coming through Libya to Europe, if we have a proportion. And a second question, maybe tomorrow, um, would we know what exactly Italy will need in terms of um, Frontex plus operation, uh, in terms of money or uh, boats as well? Thanks. When it comes to Libya, the External Action Service have uh, some cooperation with Libya, but you all know that Libya is, is, is a failed state, uh, struck by, by sectorial violence and, and a very, very difficult situation. There are elements of, of constructive forces, and we are, of course, trying to reach out to those to see how we can cooperate. But Libya is a very, very difficult country to, to cooperate with. Maybe Dr. Visser has, but uh, I have no figures from, from, from Libya, but we know that almost all of the boats coming to Italy come from Libya, basically all of them. Uh, but uh, for the rest of the countries, uh, I mean, Libya is not uh, transiting Germany. Or, well, I'll, I'll leave that question to Visser. Uh, when it comes to Italy and, and support, uh, we will, the Italians have indeed asked for, 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 for a lot of help, and we are, of course, all the time trying to, 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 to support them as much as we can. When it comes to a Frontex Plus or a continuation of, of the Mare Nostrum, we are now engaging with the Italian authorities because, of course, they need to come up with exactly what, what would we need, they need in order to continue operation, a scaled-down operation, what would be the needs when it comes to equipment and staff and so on. We don't have that picture yet. Uh, once we have it, it will, of course, be easier to, to engage with other member states uh, and so on. Very shortly, because uh, I cannot add very much more. Uh, as the Commissioner said, the boats are nearly all coming from or via Libya. Uh, so if you add the daily numbers that you can see every day in the press, uh, then you have more or less the number that is coming by Libya. Uh, Lucia Sali, Italian News Agency, Anza. Uh, just a question on Italy. What's your uh, assessment of the asylum situation in Italy compared to what Italy asks to you and all the complaints that um, Europe doesn't do enough to help Italy? Thanks. Well, it is not fair to say that Europe has abandoned Italy, certainly not the Commission. As I said, uh, we have helped them in the past. The last financial perspective, Italy received almost 500 millions from the different asylum, integration, uh, etc. funds uh, under, under that heading. For the next financial perspective, Italy will be the biggest recipient of the funds. We mobilized uh, also, President Barroso himself was engaged in mobilizing this 30 million emergency fund after Lampedusa. Uh, the main part of that has gone to Italy. Uh, we have uh, tried to support them in different ways, the uh, ordinary operations of Frontex, but also Frontex uh, trying to assist in the, um, the Mare Nostrum. And we are uh, calling for other countries when it comes to resettlement and also engaging with third countries. So it's not fair to say that the Commission has abandoned Italy. We are aware of the, of the huge pressure and, and the formidable work that Italy does in saving lives every night, uh, basically. Member States can do more, and I hope that the discussions tomorrow at the, uh, the Jai Council Member States will also see how, how more on the short term and on long term uh, Italy can have when it is uh, also clearer exactly what kind of, of assistance is, is Italy uh, expecting.